So first and foremost, what I would like to do is just thank you guys for coming out on this nice winter evening uh, to speak about block scheduling. We weren't 100% sure on how many people were going to show up. So I think that is indicative of two things. We've, all, we've either done a very good job communicating everything out to the community or we didn't. So I guess that will be determined later. But first of all, I would just like to introduce myself. My name is Tim Ketty, and I'm the new principal here at Penridge High School. And I am absolutely honored and privileged to be able to stand in front of you to speak about an initiative that started two years ago. All right, so my joke would be, if you've got complaints, don't call my office, because I just started three months ago. But beyond that, we have a tremendous team here who has literally spent two years of work putting this together, and it is going to come to fruition starting next academic school year. So what I'd like to do, one of my first things that, that I did when I came into the district was really sit down and actually start defining specific roles for my administrative team here. All right, so this actually, this slide serves as our agenda for tonight. All right, I'm going to do a brief introduction and kind of speak to you about the modern student and the why we are moving to block scheduling. It's going to be followed by Mrs. Gersh, who is our current senior class uh, principal. She will be having the incoming class coming in because we work in a house system, but you guys know this already. But she is basically primarily in charge of our professional development here at school. So she's going to speak about the professional development and the historical context of where we were and how we got to where we are now. That will be followed by Mr. Hughes, who is a current junior class principal. He is our master scheduler. So his primary role throughout course selection and in block is developing that schedule from the inside out, I should say. That will be followed by Mr. Zaplicki, who is our 10th grade principal who basically oversees our AP and dual enrollment courses, which will be followed by Mr. Ott, who will speak about our clubs and activities and how block scheduling is going to impact that. And then that would be followed by Mr. Hagen, who is the assistant principal in charge of athletics and pupil services, and he'll spend a brief time speaking about how block scheduling is going to impact that. So that is kind of our path for tonight. And I'm just starting with my slide, why? And I mentioned that. And Simon Sinek, who is a very well-known, he's a writer and, and leadership kind of entrepreneur. He has lots of YouTube videos. And what I would do is, when you get a moment, just Google him and look him up. Because he, he does some really, really good work about how the modern workforce actually has transpired from what our students are going through and how things have changed from many of you who are sitting there who of our cohort as far as the difference between how our children behave today. So I wanna spend a little bit of time just speaking about that why, but in the context of the modern student. So I thought, trying to find my hook how can I make this a little bit interesting, maybe bring a smile to your face? But these two little comics up here are a pretty good vignette of where our students are. Especially the one to my left, your right. Like, if I learn how to use Google, why do I need an education? And there is a certain amount of truth to that. Plus, I just thought the other one was funny. It's my guilty plug warring against your children's unfettered use to social media and reliance on cell phones. But that's probably a conversation for a different time. But we, had, we were just having a, a conversation in my office, and I'm like, what does BRB mean? It just shows you the difference. But I get return. But within the context of the modern student and what they're going through, I want you to, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but there's a lot of research out there and the author of this particular end is a guy by the name of Tim Elmore. And what he speaks about is from a generational standpoint, 
why kids behave the way that they behave today. And it's basically because they've grown up in a society that perpetuates speed, convenience, entertainment, nurturing, and entitlement. Now my caveat to this, moms and dads who are sitting out there, and even the kids who are sitting here, it's nobody's fault. We didn't set out to actually have things go this way. And if I had the time, I'd show a picture of my daughter, uh, who's 22, graduated from Temple, graduated from Penridge High School. And I have this picture of the day we dropped her off at school. And I took this picture because I'm sitting on Broad Street at Temple University. And we had to unpack the cars. And like, it, it was just a gargantuan amount of stuff that we spent all summer purchasing so that she could be successful there. So I took this picture of it. And then we spent a good six hours getting her dorm room all ready to go. And then what do you think we did when we were finished setting her room up? Come on, somebody. You guys are killing me here. You're just looking at me. What do you think we did? I, no, leave her alone? Heck no. She was with her mom. It was her first kid going. There was no way my wife was letting her alone. What do you think we did? Say it again. That's what I anticipated you say. Yes, it ended up being at dinner, but first we had to go to Target to buy more stuff, to buy all the stuff that we forgot to bring off of the original U-Haul stuff that we dropped off. So when I speak about speed, convenience, entertainment, that nurturing component, I'm a product of that as well. All right? But from a school-based side, we need to push back on certain components of that, but embrace other ones. And that's where block scheduling fits into this. This is where our ability to change the way that we are actually scheduling our kids and our students can be of major benefit to their post-secondary goals. And what I mean by post-secondary is in high school, our goal is to help your children accomplish whatever goals that might be, whether that's entering the workforce, going to college, getting a job, joining the military. So you'll hear this term, pathways. How is it that we can prepare your child for whatever pathway that they want? And the way of doing that is coming into block scheduling. This slide has been out there in this community for close to two years. So I'm not going to go bullet by bullet. But what block scheduling at its grassroot allows us to do is take a traditional seven period day, which allows your students to take the maximum of 28 classes and expands their ability and opportunities to take up to 32 classes, to earn 32 credits. In short, without the Pollyanna or standing in front of you uh, claiming it to be the greatest thing since sliced bread, that's not what this is about. It is about providing flexibility and opportunity within their scheduling. Secondary to that, and I'm just going to go back if I do it right. No, it went the wrong way. All right. It affords our teachers and our students now to be in classrooms 85 minutes at a time, which helps those relations back and forth and have a deeper understanding of what the content is. Secondary to that, it also models more like what their post-secondary educational experience will be. They'll have semester courses, but Mr. Hughes will walk you through that. So as part of this process, as we increase the opportunities for students to take more classes, what we've done is we've increased their graduation requirements. Now again, this slide is in the program of studies and has been out into the community for a very long time. So I don't know how detailed that I need to go, but what I want to do is how many uh, parents of current sophomores do we have? Handful, right? So, the, so they're entering, they've programmed one year, all right? I can know two years in the current model. Juniors? Perfect, right? Now, they've had three years of, uh, you know, programmings, and then I guess there's no seniors here. How about freshmen? All right, so you only have one year, so we don't, 
have to worry too much about you guys. You're not too used to the other system. But a lot of thought was put into place as to how we honor the fact that your children and you as parents have already planned in a different system. Does that make sense? We're just not ripping you out and throwing you into a new system. Here's the other thing that I can say to every parent in here is that all of the increase in requirements are of an elective nature. That's it. We didn't change any of the major requirements. With every year, all we did, juniors got one elective when they're seniors. Sophomores, two. Freshmen, three. That's it. The incoming class, as you can see up here, will have another social studies requirement. All right, but everybody sitting in front of me does not have that as part of their graduation requirements. It's simply just one more elective. All right, this slide takes us through minimum credit requirements per year. All right, we firmly believe that our freshmen and our sophomores, okay, need to take eight blocks or eight credits. From a developmental standpoint, the structure that we can provide in school is what we believe is the most important thing. What you'll see is juniors and seniors only have six credits that they're required to take per year. Again, that is because as older students, when you're in that 16, 17, and 18 years old, we want to provide more flexibility for those particular students, but still have a, a focus on coming to school. All right? That is an important component of this. There's a caveat at the bottom, and I'll speak about this. The seniors, incoming seniors, the class of 2025, will have to take five. All right, I know it says six up there. That's for the next class. Why? Because you've already programmed three years within the construct of only having 24 credits. All right, so what we want to do is honor that fact, all right, not have, you ha not have students take courses that they might not necessarily need, but still have a general focus of ensuring that they're taking classes that are meaningful to them. Now, this is a new slide, all right? And we, we developed this slide in response to a lot of the questions that we've gotten, the frequently asked questions and feedback from the community. And what this essentially does is it breaks down that for a junior who is going to be a senior next year, if they took all of the credits that they could have taken for the first three years, they would have 21 credits starting next year. Does that make sense? All right, now, here's what I don't know. I don't know where your child is at. There could be some, some students that actually have more than 21. It's possible. And there's some that could have less. That's an individual decision that, that you have to work through as a family, and we're aware of that. But the minimum, requir the minimum requirements that they would need to graduate would be four. 21 plus four is 25. That's what that would be. However, you have eight blocks available to you next year, which means they essentially have four open classes. Does that make sense? You follow, you follow our logic there? So we increased your graduation requirements, but based on who you are as a student and where you are in that spectrum of filling that, all right, and we're talking average here, you're still gonna have four open blocks to take whatever courses that you want. To me, to our school, that's something that we value, providing that flexibility. So if you are a current sophomore and you're becoming a junior, and you fulfilled all of your credit obligations, you, would have, you, you should be going into next year with 14, or possibly 14, some might have more, some might have less. You guys get that. You're going to need 12 to fulfill your 26 graduation requirements. You have 16 blocks in two years. You see the pattern here? Which still means you have four flexible blocks to take whatever courses you want. 
our current freshmen had the same situation. Right? So when there's this question of why are we increasing graduation requirements, there's actually consistency in our ability to provide the same flexibility for all students independent of where they are in that continuum. So I'm, I'm, my hope is that through these pictures and having those discussions, you can see the flexibility and opportunity that creates for our students. All right, I'm not going to spend too much time here, but this is something we're very proud of, that uh, the incoming freshmen next year, the class of 2028, will have an opportunity to earn what is called a scholar's diploma. And essentially what that means is if they fulfill the requirements that are above. This is taking our, our academic requirements and saying, now you are not meeting the minimum requirements. You are going above and beyond those minimum requirements which I think is what the community would want for all of our students, whether from a technical standpoint or from an academic standpoint. What we want to do is provide the most opportunity for all students to accomplish whatever their goals are. We need to celebrate when people are moving above and beyond those minimum requirements. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask Mrs. Garish to come up and she is going to speak to you about our professional learning path over the last over the last two years and actually beyond. And I think we got a better system here for our transitions. Thank you very much, Mr. Kenny. I've been with the district for about 15 years, and for about nine of them, I've been really involved in developing professional learning. This is my fourth year as a house principal. And during this time of working with our teachers here at Penridge, and when I was a teacher myself here at Penridge, the number one focus of our professional learning for the last 15 years has been about how to best engage students, how to create student-centered learning environments. So this is nothing new for our teachers, but it's something that we really will be leveraging as we move into the block schedule. So beginning two years ago, as we started to discuss block scheduling, we really started to focus on making sure that our teachers understood the why, that Mr. Kenny shared just a few moments ago, the why behind block scheduling, and then also the how. So you'll see up here just a timeline of some of what we have done in order to prepare our teachers. We started really looking at our goals for block scheduling. We started to look at some of the research involved. We were engaged in book studies around engagement and teaching strategies. We also were beginning to go and visit different schools engaging in block scheduling, using the strategies there, and then we started to really start to plan what our block schedule would look like. So our teachers have been involved in developing our block schedule from the start. Then as we look into this school year, we've really been focused more on those specific strategies that can be utilized in block schedule. We have our topics that we've talked about in our, our professional learning days, our structured topics that we've discussed. We also have teachers who engage in professional learning outside of our professional learning days with our PLT hours. All of our PLT has been focused on these strategies for engaging students. When I went and talked to the eighth graders, since I will have the ninth graders next year, and I said to the eighth graders that their classes will be 85 minutes, Students suddenly were like, wait, what are we going to be doing? Like, don't worry. We've been working with teachers. Your teachers know you're going to need to get up and move around. They're going to be able to offer you times for assessment and reflection during your lesson. So don't worry. We've, we've got it figured out. You're not going to be listening to a lecture for 85 minutes long. We've really been focusing on those ways to entice and engage our learners. In addition, again, to these structured times in our professional learning, talking about instruction, talking about best practices for teaching in the block is something that all of the administrative team does whenever they're having a conversation with a teacher. Whether it's after an observation or a walkthrough in a classroom, we're always going back to the idea of how will this change in the block? How would you change this activity? How would you change this unit? And that's where we're focusing our attention as we finish up the school year. Really taking a look at how we can recalibrate our curriculum, not change it, but restructure in terms of time and pacing as we move into a block format. We also communicate with our teachers weekly through an email Tuesday check-in. 
That includes professional learning opportunities for our students. We highlight specific strategies that can be utilized in the block. We have teachers collaborate as well through that communication with electronic message boards. So our teachers are constantly thinking about how they're going to enhance their practices and recalibrate their practices for education in an 85 minute period. So I'm really excited with all the work that's been done and that we'll be continuing to do as we master this new mode of instruction, which really isn't new at all. It's just taking what we've already done and working it in a longer period of time. Thank you, Mrs. Gersh. Again, I'm Abe Hughes. I'm the house principal for the class of 25, and I'm going to be the master scheduler as we move to our new block schedule. I'm really excited about it. Prior to coming to Penn Ridge, all I've ever known is a block schedule. Um, when I went to high school, it was in a block scheduled school. And when I was a teacher, it was always in a block schedule. So I am familiar with it. And I'm excited about um, many of the benefits that come from a block. So here is our bell schedule that we will be utilizing next year in our block schedule. One thing that you'll, you'll notice a few things when you look at this, but one thing right off the bat is there is a, a beauty in its simplicity. I was just starting to get used to period four, five, period five, six, period seven, eight, all those, right? Those are gone. Those are gone. And we now have four blocks. But you will notice two things, I think, and I want to point them out. The first thing you'll notice is at the very top, and that is something called flex. And that's short for a flexible learning time for our students. Most high schools incorporate some version of flexible learning time for their students. In fact, we incorporate flex time right now in our current schedule. Okay, and those are called RAMS days. You have a RAMS period. That happens once every six days, and it's 50 minutes in length. So one thing we're really excited about in our new schedule is offering students daily flex time. It's 25 minutes a day, but daily flex time when they can collaborate with their teachers and peers, they can receive academic support, they can access enrichment activities. All of the things that they are doing now in their flexible learning time, but now on a more frequent basis. And we think that's really important because our, our kids, our students, they are getting more and more busy. We'll hear later from Mr. Ott about clubs and extracurriculars, as well as Mr. Hagen about sports, athletics, right? We have a lot going on. Our kids have a lot going on. And so for us to be able to build in time every single day for them to meet with their teachers and collaborate with peers is huge. You also might notice block three, okay? Block three is going to be the block that houses all of our lunches. Okay, so there still will be three lunches that happen. An A lunch, a B lunch, and a C lunch. And that will be based on the subject or the course that your student has during block three. So if they have A lunch after block two at 1040, they're gonna report directly to the cafeteria for their half hour lunch, and then after that, they'll go to their block three class. If they have C lunch after block two, they'll go to block three, and 30 minutes prior to the end of block three, they will report to the cafeteria and have their lunch. Those are still 85 minute instructional blocks. The last lunch is B lunch. And for that lunch, students will show up to block three at 1045. They'll have about 42 minutes of instructional time. Then they'll go to the lunchroom eat their lunch, and then go back to that same class. So that block three class is interrupted by lunch. This will be done purposefully. In other words, your student won't be in a science class block three and have B lunch, right? They won't be in the middle of a lab, something's on fire, and they have to go eat their lunch and come back. Okay, that won't happen. So the departments and the courses that have each specific lunch will be done strategically and it will make sense for the courses that they are in. Here's what that schedule looks like for our Upper Bucks County Technical School students, both AM and PM schedules. 
The two things to note here would be, and, and this was really important to us, our tech students will have the same flexible learning time opportunity that all of our other students have. Okay, the same opportunity. Every single day, 25 minutes of flex time. The other thing that you might not notice, a little bit more detailed, is that both our AM and PM tech students will have more time at the tech school, more time in their shops at the tech school with our new schedule. Okay, so absolute benefits for our students attending Upper Bucks Technical School in that they have the same flexible learning time that all of our students have, and they actually get more time at the tech school. Here's a look at just a very generic block schedule. Most, again, most of our year-long courses in our current schedule are now changing to semester-long courses. And so you'll see exactly what's been talked about, which is that students will have fewer courses at any given time while they'll have more credits per school year with this schedule. Okay, but this is a very generic schedule in that we have different structures for different courses. So this is showing all semester-based courses. We will have some courses that still just go one marking period in length. We will have some courses that go year long, but on an every other day schedule. Okay, so courses, and if you've looked at the program of studies, courses are offered in different formats. So here's a, a better example of what a schedule might look like. It has a little bit more of that variation that I just spoke about, which is some courses offered as a semester, such as geometry or physics one, and other courses offered as just a marking period or quarter long course. That would be photography one or ceramics. But there's more variations, and if you've taken a look, and if you haven't, you should, take a look at our program of studies. It's posted on our website. And when you read through that program of studies and you see every course that we offer here, you will also see how those courses could be offered in terms of the structure. Does it run as a semester, 18 week long course? Or does it run as an all year, every other day? Okay, those structures are important, but I also want you to, to keep a few things in mind. And right now we are right in the middle of program planning here at the high school. So as of right now, the Power School portal is open for students. What that means is that they can right now select the courses that they want to take for next year. One of, if not the most important thing that they will do here at high school on a yearly basis is select or request the courses that they want to take the following school year. And so there's two things that they should be thinking about. They should be thinking about how many credits do I need to take? Mr. Ketty just went over that, all right? And that's the requirement that we're setting out. So my class, those students who will be seniors next year, need to take five credits. So you have to think about that. But you also should be thinking about your interest. What do you want to try out? What courses really make you excited to come to Penridge High School? And I want you to request those courses. So when you're doing this, and if you're looking at the program of studies, one common discussion or conversation will go something like this. I want to take that course, but it doesn't seem like it's going to fit with anything. If that's a discussion that you've had or that you are going to have, I want you to kind of reframe that and again go back to, am I meeting the number of credits required? And am I requesting the courses that I'm interested in taking? Fitting the puzzle together, that's my job. That's our job as a team. So what we'll do is once we have those numbers, we're going to try to make this work for as many students as we possibly can. And we're going to try to make the most effective schedule for everyone. That being said, there will be times 
like there are in any scheduling process at any high school, there will be times when you request something and based on your other requests, we can't make it all work. Okay, but that is not a product of the block schedule. That's a product of scheduling for 2,300 students in high school. Okay, the portal closes on Thursday at midnight. Okay, so Thursday at 11.59 p.m. You have all day Thursday where the portal will still be open. I encourage you, have your kids get out their laptop, open up PowerSchool, and have them show you what courses they requested for next school year. Start to have those conversations. Starting on Friday and into next week, every single student here at Penridge High School is going to meet individually with their counselor. Those conversations are far more productive when your student has the requests in the system. If they don't have anything requested, the counselor has to do a lot of that work figuring out what are you interested in, right? Do that now, do that at home, have conversations, look at that program of studies, get those requests in, and we're excited about the opportunities that the block schedule is going to provide for our students including AP and dual enrollment opportunities. Okay, so one of the other parts of our student life here and our opportunities for students are our AP and dual enrollment opportunities. And this is yet another area that we believe is going to be enhanced by block scheduling. So dual enrollment, if you're not familiar with it, is an opportunity for students to uh, take classes at the college level in one way or another, but also earn, and earn college credit, but also earn credit here at the high school. Um, all dual enrollment courses are weighted like an AP course, so that also helps with their um, GPA, class ranking, and things like that. Um, there are different options for how students participate, and in fact, in our we have a great relationship with a couple different uh, colleges and universities, one being Bucks County Community College, which is, in fact, right across the street, and we have a very strong relationship with them, uh, where students can take courses and get credit here and get credit there as well. There's a lot of different options for students. One of those courses, in fact, is taught here at the high school by one of our high school teachers, but also grants them credit in both the high school and at the, at the college. We also have similar relationships with the University of Pittsburgh and Gwynn Mercy, um, where a teacher at the high school will teach a course here, um, but the course will also receive credit for that college or university, and of course get AP weighted credit here. So there's a couple different configurations, and we're hoping as we move forward to expand that. Um, and block scheduling also kind of follows along with the college model where things are semesterized and not, they don't go through an entire, uh, an entire year. Um, much more information is available in the program of studies if you check that out. Now, if your student is, and I see a couple students in here, so if you're interested in a dual enrollment opportunity, just register for your classes like there is no such thing as dual enrollment. That information will come later and then we can make those changes and provide those opportunities and give you that information. But right now, you just want to register like you're registering for a regular class um, and information about the dual enrollment opportunity or courses that might have that kind of credit are spelled out in the program of studies, but that specific information will come from teachers and guidance counselors along the way. Okay, AP courses kind of fit right along with that model of something you're doing in high school that will have a direct impact on what college could look like for you. We have 26 courses available. That number just expanded by one to 26 this, for this coming year, and hopefully we can expand that even more as we move forward. Um, AP courses provide college rigor and also potential college credits. Now you'll notice at the bottom, the college credit thing is a little bit different than say dual enrollment because it's up to individual colleges and universities uh, how they um, give you credit for those classes or what they give you for those, and that depends upon where you apply and whether you're accepted and what the scores might be on your AP exam. Uh, and of course, in order to, get the, to be considered for some type of college credit, 
uh, wherever you, you intend to go, you do have to take the AP exam at the end of the course. That's, that's usually uh, how it works. Um, classes, AP classes are scheduled in different ways and block scheduling allows us those different opportunities depending on the content of the course and depending on the amount of credits um, that we offer with a particular AP course. Uh, we can schedule them in different ways. Uh, some are every other day, some are straight for a semester, and some are configured even differently than that, depending again on the course and content. And it's something that's spelled out in the program of studies and something that your guidance counselors can explain uh, with a little more detail. But of course, all of this information is available in the program of studies. Now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Ott, who's going to talk about uh, clubs and activities. How's everybody doing? My name is Ray Ott. I'm the house principal for the class of 27. This is my 22nd year here at Penridge, and I've stayed here that long because I think it's a great place. Uh, during those 22 years, one of the responsibilities that I've had that I've thoroughly enjoyed is I've always been in, in charge of the clubs and the activities, the fun stuff, okay? And the thing I want you to know is, is that clubs and activities, if you read any kind of study or any kind of research, what they say is that students who are involved in clubs and activities do better in school, okay? It promotes leadership, it promotes teamwork, it promotes compassion, empathy, understanding, all the things we want from our students and for our children. And the cool thing about Penn Ridge is that we have tw like 2,300 kids here, so we have a lot of different interests and a lot of different abilities, but we never let anybody get lost in the shuffle because we create clubs that our students want. We currently are running 51 clubs. Okay, that's a, that's a great number. Over the years, we've always been between 45 and 60 clubs. So we're sitting at 51, and the clubs, they can come, come and go depending on the kid's interest and who graduates and who wants a club. But the great thing about it is, okay, the one thing we always do is we, we always give the kids the opportunity to start their own club. I put this up here because I wanted to sh show you a couple clubs. For example, academic clubs. We have like debate club. We have academic challenge. Our service clubs, like key club, okay? Recreational, they maybe changed the name from sporty, okay? It was sporty, they changed it to recreational. But it's pretty cool, we have pickleball. We have a pickleball club. It's all the rage in the, in the world now today. We also have a ski and board club, which is one of our most popular clubs. We have over 200 kids going on that club on Thursday nights. So we have tons of opportunity for students to get involved in. What we would like you to do is go home and encourage your children and say, hey, I was just at this program tonight and I learned that you only have to take four classes next year. So you're gonna have some extra time. You could get involved in some clubs and activities. And if you go to the QR code up top, that's on our website and it goes home in every s'more and it'll take, you to, it'll take you to a s'more for clubs and activities and it'll show you the clubs that we run. So please encourage your children to get involved. The four years goes fast. We all know that because we did it. We, we went to high school, it goes fast and you don't get to go back again. So I encourage them to take the opportunity to get involved because it's fun and because it's gonna help them do better in all facets of life, okay? Thank you very much. Here's Mr. Hagen. He's gonna talk about fun stuff too. Athletics, so one of my key roles here is the athletic director for the high school. Uh, we currently have uh, nearly 30 teams that participate in all kinds of sports for the three seasons of the school year. Um, athletics in the block. So the opportunity to have this flexible time in the morning is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, not only will our, will our coaches be able to meet with teams to do some pre-work for classes or to get, do interest meetings, things like that, but our students who sometimes get dismissed a little bit early from the school day uh, to go to their away matches, they'll have 25 minutes that day or the next day uh, to go and visit with their teachers and look at the opportunities of things that they missed in class 
uh, from going to their event. So they can catch up on work, they can go through things with them to uh, get a better understanding of what they may have missed during the time. Now our, our school teams, uh, sometimes they dismiss uh, during the school day. Right now, majority of them leave class about 1.15, 1.30 uh, to get to their away games. Um, in the traditional schedule that we have, 1.15 is the end of ninth period. So many of our students are missing all of 10th period. With going to the block schedule, if we still have those times to leave, they're gonna have from 12.45 to 1.15, they're gonna have about a half hour of class before they have to leave. So they're gonna have the opportunity to meet with their teachers, gather what they have to gather for class for the next day, and still be prepared. And the last piece is with four classes, and I know this having been a, an athlete myself and a parent of one, uh, there's a lot of time when you go home after school and you've gotta to get to practice, or you don't go home after school and you go right to practice, and you get home late, or you have a late game where you're down at Ben Salem on a Thursday night and you get back at 10:15 back to the high school. The opportunity will be there not only in that flex time the next morning, but you will have time to focus on just four classes. The likelihood of having seven classes worth of work right now is, is possible, but now we're gonna cut that down. We're not gonna have four classes to worry about for homework and papers and studying and all those things. So the, for an athletic piece, block schedule will benefit our students uh, as athletes because I'll have more time to focus on a little bit less. Um, and that's a, 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 a breather for them, right? They're used to running from one sport to another, one practice to a game or whatever it may be. Uh, and they're gonna have a little bit more time on their hands to just focus on those four courses that they're gonna have. I'm gonna hand it back over to Mr. Ketty and he'll finish things up for the evening. I learned something tonight as we kind of move into the final one. Consideration. I learned that apparently out of our administrative team, Mr. Ott and Mr. Hagen like to have fun and the rest of us don't. <laughs> but before I get into these last points, I wanna kind of walk you through tonight. Mrs. Garish got up. We're ready. As a staff, as an administrative team, we're ready. I'm looking over here, and I was a little bit remiss because I didn't introduce Dr. Scheid, who is, again, she's, probably, she's the assistant superintendent in charge of curriculum. She's probably here checking just to make sure that I'm doing my job. But I also have Mr. Thomas back there, our director of communication. But when I look over in this corner, there's well over a century's worth of experience. We're ready to move the block. Is it going to be perfect? Probably not. I'm just a realist. But we have the right people in place and the right structures, and that's what Mrs. Garris was talking about. We're prepared. Mr. Hughes steps up. He's my math guy. You heard him. He's a, he, he, is, he is a master scheduler and has been a part of block scheduling for the better part of almost 20 years. We have that expertise from a scheduling standpoint. To Mr. Zaplicki, who is a humanities teacher and worked within our dual enrollment and our AP courses. Then again, we have that followed by Mr. Hagen and Mr. Ott, who just like to have fun. But those co-curricular opportunities are really an enhancing part of that educational experience, which I started by saying, flexibility and opportunity. That is what block scheduling is about. So when you talk about your considerations, and we kind of bring this home, the first point up there is independent versus interdependence. If we truly, and these are words that are interchanged at times that I think we misunderstand from like an academic standpoint. Because if you truly as parents wanted to have independent kids, you'd stop cooking for them, stop buying them clothes, and just let them function on their own. And here's what would happen. They'd figure it out. I don't know if that would work out best for society, but they would figure it out. What we're really trying to do is develop interdependence. And interdependence refers to when your child is walking through school, do they know how to access the resources that will help them be successful? 
Because what we know as adults that our success is predominantly dependent on the other people and other people around us and how we can access their expertise. Block scheduling is going to help to that end. Maturity level. You know the maturity level of your child better than we do. So as you're considering what courses to take and how this block scheduling is going to, uh, is going to impact where, whether you're a sophomore, junior, or, or, or moving into that senior year next year, you need to take into consideration the maturity level of your child and what they have the capability of doing and what they don't. Which leads into time commitments. To Mr. Hagen's point, and Mr. Ott said this too, life is moving fast. Are they working? What are the time commitments from job outside of school? What athletic teams are they on? How many co-curricular opportunities? When you're thinking about what courses and what pathway, let's think about that. As, as Mr. Hughes said, Thursday, right? Is that drop dead date where power school is going to close at 1159? All right, put those courses in there. Have conversations with your kids about timelines, maturity level, what they, what they are capable of doing. Attendance. To me, it's all connected. We need to have a priority of our school, uh, of our students to be attending school. Because as we shift to block and move to a semester course, the reality of that situation is when a student is missing a class, that's really two classes. So I, that's not a warning. That's almost like, I, hey, I think as we're entering in the block and the considerations as parents, you need to understand that, that there's more emphasis on those classes, which then leads to the maturity level. But we need, to be, we need to be able to take a look collectively as a school and as parents and say, how is that actually going to manifest itself and what is that going to look like? And I think that resides a bit on the parents pushing back on their kids saying, dude, you got to get to class. You got to be there on time. which comes to priorities. Now, when you think about flex time, and when I thought about priorities, and it was interesting, I was at Giant the other day, because I do live in the community, and I was talking to a father, and he said that, he told me, his story was that his daughter's goal as a senior was to make sure that she was selecting classes, and I want you to think about this, and no judgment crossed, because she wanted to have late arrival and early release. I thought, hey, if you've got yourself in that situation, that's probably not a bad thing. But within a block schedule, you've got eight blocks to fill. What is your priority? How are you going to take a look? And, and what emphasis from a school-based side or from a family standpoint, what is the priority you're going to put on that flex time? Is it going to be, hey, I can just show up to school at 740 and enter into my first block? Or is it going to be I'm going to be able to take advantage of the fact that I can go meet with all of my teachers, explore those clubs? and participate at a higher level, priorities. So they're the decisions that we need to come collectively with. And that's where I always offer up the partnership between school and the community. How is it that we are going to be able to work together to be able to put your children in the best position moving forward? That's why all of the administrative team is here tonight speaking to you about their respective expertise and responsibilities throughout the course of the day, but this is an ongoing process. I put my clicker here, because at the end of the day, what did I do with the clicker? And I'm gonna leave you with this. Come on, that's funny. <laughs> So I always have this statement, whenever we, the ultimate goal from a parent side should be, right, and, and quote my words, you can use this steel if you want to make sure that your child is not living in your basement when they're 35 years old. And we are here to help you do that to the best of our abilities and look forward to continue um, moving with Block. And we're going to be hanging out here. Can you give a round of applause for my awesome administrative team over there? We'll be hanging out to answer any specific questions, but I also want to caveat that, like when it, that most of the questions that are coming through to us are specific scheduling questions. 
right? Those scheduling questions are going to be best answered after course selection is done. And that's where your guidance counselors and your grade level principals can walk everybody through those specific nuances for individual students. Thank you for your time tonight, and I look forward to uh, continuing developing our partnership between Penridge High School and the parents here. Have a great evening, guys.